Hey, Bible readers, I'm Tara Lee Cobble, and I'm your host for the Bible Recap. If you're doing our New Testament plan, today we finished our 11th book. And if you're doing the whole Bible, we finished book number 50. Yesterday, we finished up with Paul telling us what it looks like to love each other well. And today, he opens up by continuing that line of thought. He reminds us that there's room for a lot of different personal opinions and preferences in the body of Christ, and that we shouldn't give each other grief over those differences. Quarreling can provoke feelings of superiority and inferiority. It incites our flesh and promotes pride. It brings more division than unity. When it comes to your own convictions, walk according to how the Spirit directs you but trust the Spirit to guide other people in their convictions as well. They may be at a different part of their journey than you are, and that's okay. God is sovereign over their steps too. Verse 4 reminds us that God is the one who upholds us and sustains our obedience. Ultimately, when it comes to the non-essentials in life, even the religious aspects of life, Paul says it's better to agree to disagree than to argue and try to prove your point. The time when we should be concerned with another believer's actions is when our actions are tripping them up. Serve your brothers and sisters well by your actions. If you have to lay down some rights and preferences for them, that's okay. Love is a good reason to pivot. We don't just expect peace to happen naturally. We have to actively pursue it, to disengage from the flesh and engage with the spirit. And he says to not only pursue peace, but mutual upbuilding as well. If this were a sliding scale, We could put division and quarreling as a negative number, and peace would be zero or neutral, then mutual upbuilding would be on the positive end of that scale. This isn't just peace, this is progress. Verse 22 is often taken out of context by people who prefer to keep their faith on the down low. It says, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Given what we read about earlier in this letter from Paul about sharing the gospel, and given what we've seen from Jesus and what we've seen them both do with their days and their lives, Do you think for a second that this verse means your faith is private, don't talk about it? Of course not. The word keep here means hold firmly, not be quiet about. Paul is telling them to hold firmly to their convictions from God, to live them out. It means let it show up in everything. It's the exact opposite of keeping things private. In chapter 15, Paul tells us why the Old Testament exists. He says, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Hebrew scriptures exist to instruct us, to encourage us, and to give us hope. Hope. Many of you who are with us during the Old Testament have testified to the fact that it did that very thing for you. You found hope in unexpected places. Hope in the laws of Leviticus. Hope in the slaughter of judges. Hope even in the weird visions of Ezekiel. Who knew? It is stacked, Genesis to Malachi, with instruction, encouragement, and hope. Paul reiterates this in verse 13, which says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The Holy Spirit brings us hope too. And that checks out, because guess who wrote scripture? The hope giver, the Holy Spirit. Paul also points out places in the Old Testament where God promised to save the Gentiles. This diversity in God's family has been his plan all along. Along with these reminders, Paul encourages them again to live in harmony with each other. Harmony means people are singing different notes, not the same note. A symphony is beautiful because people are playing different instruments and different parts, but in a way that works together to reveal the beauty of the song. He says this harmony should be with each other and also with Christ. It's not good if we're unified with each other, but we're singing a different song than Jesus. He wants us to sing one song that points to the glory of God, and in order to do that, we have to welcome our fellow choir members, not try to lock them in the robe closet or pray they get laryngitis. He even wants them to get to the place where they can peaceably learn to instruct each other. It's that mutual upbuilding again. That's what happens when we all aim to grow in wisdom and we surround ourselves with wise people. We can learn not only from what God is teaching us, but from what he's teaching other people as well. If you're doing the Bible recap with someone else, you're probably learning from what they're learning. 
I've heard from lots of you who say that even your children, six, seven, 10, 12 years old, have pointed things out from that day's reading that astonished you. And not because, wow, they figured that out so young, but because, hey, I didn't even notice that myself. Surround yourself with people who are seeing God, who are singing the same song. This is what mutual upbuilding looks like. Paul begins to close out his letter to the church at Rome by letting them know he loves them and that he's heading to Jerusalem to deliver the financial support he's been collecting from the churches. But later he hopes to come back and visit them on his way to Spain. In chapter 16, we get some clues that Paul's letter is probably being delivered to the Roman church by a woman named Phoebe. He tells them to welcome her because she's a servant of the church. The word used for servant here is diakonos, the word used for deacon. So Phoebe was quite possibly a deacon in one of the churches near Athens. We've linked to an article with more info on this in case you want to read more about what this might have meant in the first century church. By the way, first century travel was especially dangerous. Think of all Paul encountered in his travels, and then imagine a woman doing that in that day and culture. So Paul tells the church, give that woman whatever she needs. Yes, sir. He goes on to list other men and women he wants them to greet, including a and whom he says risked their lives for him. This is almost certainly not hyperbole. They probably nearly died to help Paul advance the gospel, probably during the riots in Ephesus. Then, just as his pen is about to run out of ink, he's like, here are some people I do not want you to greet, the people who deceive the hearts of the naive. This is just a quick line, but it points out that what we know informs our hearts. Knowledge can protect us from deception. That's huge, especially if we don't want to be misled about who God is. I'm so excited about my God shot. It's in 1620, which says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. First of all, it's interesting that the God of peace is doing some crushing. In order to bring peace in any situation, you can't ignore the chaos. You have to address it. So God addresses the chaos of Satan and evil, and he crushes it. Second, this verse shows us that we are participants in the battle God has won. God crushes Satan under our feet. He does the crushing under our feet. And if that's terrifying for you, the good news is that verse 25 says, God is the one who strengthens us. He makes us strong. He moves our feet and he crushes the enemy under them. Wow. He's where the joy is. I'm so glad you're here. If you want to help others find their way to these videos, the best way to do that is to like, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. I love to read through your comments to remind myself that there are actual people out there watching. You are out there and you are seeing more of God each day. Your comments not only encourage me, but they position you as someone who helps others decide if they want to take the time to watch or not. It sounds simple, but you're actually helping strangers around the world connect with God. So drop us a comment if you've got a minute to spare. Give us a thumbs up. We might even feature something you've said on a social media post.